Okay, welcome back. It's now my distinct honor and privilege to introduce today's afternoon keynote, the first of those. Former Secretary of Defense, General James Mattis. A native of Richland, Washington, General Mattis enlisted in the U.S. Marine Corps when he was 18 years old. And after graduating from Central Washington State College in 1971, he was commissioned a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps. During his more than four decades of service in uniform, General Mattis commanded Marines at all levels from an infantry rifle platoon to a Marine Expeditionary Force. He led an infantry battalion in Iraq in 1991, an expeditionary brigade in Afghanistan right after the 911 terror attack in 2001, a Marine division in the initial attack and subsequent stability ops in Iraq in 2003, and he led all Marine forces in the Middle East as Commander 1 Meth and U.S. Marine Forces Central Command. As a Joint Force Commander, General Mattis commanded U.S. Joint Forces Command, Supreme Allied Command for Transformation, and the U.S. Central Command. As the U.S. Central Command Commanding General, he, he led over 200,000 soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marine, Guardsmen, and Allied forces across the entire Middle East. After completing his uniform service in 2013, he became a Davies Scholar at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Subsequently, he served as the 26th Secretary of Defense from January 2017 through December 2018, leading the entire military of over 3 million uniform and civilian personnel. General Mattis really wanted to be with us in person today but he's a man who keeps his commitments. So we convinced him to keep his teaching commitment to Stanford and still beam in today and join us live on screen. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome to the screen, Secretary of Defense, General James Mattis. Thanks, sir, Admiral Dan Shipmate, and uh, good to be with you all. Um, Am I supposed to just kick off with remarks at this point, Admiral, or do I uh, get interrogated by uh, the midshipmen? No, sir, you, you get, uh, you've got your time um, up front to, to make some remarks, and then midshipman first class Luke Miato will be up after that. Okay, very good. Uh, just, uh, it's great to be back at the Academy. I wish I was there in person, of course. Uh, but uh, I would just tell you that I'm, I'm privileged to come in to do this. I, I don't think it's something that uh, is anything special about me. I'm a, a standard uh, Mod 1 uh, naval leader, uh, and what you're going to hear is probably going to be more reinforcing today than it is going to be anything else. Uh, but leadership in our naval service uh, is all about more, much more than superintending processes. Um, that we come from a free society, and that enables a free mind and free thinking if we have the discipline and we have the uh, the education to exercise that. Uh, you're all going to be you midshipmen. You're going to be naval leaders, and that means you're going to be in a position to absorb fear and to exude hope. That's the bottom line. And the way you exude hope uh, is by free thinking, by outthinking our enemies. And I would just tell you that uh, that takes a lot of discipline. Uh, it takes the background you're getting in quantitative skills there. And it takes more than that as well. Because confronting the enemy, uh, we, we don't win today because providence is on our side. Uh, we're going to win by outthinking that enemy. And it's got an intellectual component, it's got a physical component, it's got a spiritual one, but it's really got a moral framework at the same time. Uh, so it's critical that our democracy's defense be led by thinking leaders, ones who can literally outthink the enemy. I used to keep pictures when I was a division commander of the five enemy division commanders I was up against, and I had officers uh, understudy them. But I would look at those pictures all the time, wondering what kind of mischief they were up to and what I could do to mess up their day. But I was out to outthink them before my young troops ever made contact with them. That's our responsibility as leaders. And it's right. I think it's absolutely right that this conference uh, is framed as a history conference. 
Uh, the Naval Service is part of the executive branch and our employment of history is applied history. We're not just there to look at history, to study it, to know certain things about history. It's how do you apply the lessons learned going forward? And this has a lot to do with how you're going to outthink the enemy. I'll give you an example. Just months after I had pulled out of Iraq following the invasion and initial subsequent uh, stability operations, uh, our ships were still at sea bringing our gear home when I received the warning order we were going back in, uh, this time to Al Anbar, the fiercest part uh, of the Sunni Triangle uh, where the uprising was in full swing, uh, where we'd relieved the 82nd Airborne. I couldn't go in right away on my own reconnaissance, so I sent my deputy, and he came back, and he came back after only about five days there, and we knew what we were going to do. We didn't know how long it would take, but we were going to break the Al-Qaeda link to the tribes. It took us several years to do it, and eventually it swept across Iraq when we finally turned things around, but it actually started in the fiercest part of the fighting area, the area that we were told initially going in that we were just to hold on to it, and that was all there was to it. We outthought the enemy, thanks to my deputy, General John Kelly, and everything that we did after that to try to break the tribes off, eventually paying off for us, but right down to Marines on patrol, 19-year-old uh, Marines in among the people, it was all guided by my deputy's assessment that here's how we could outsmart the enemy, and it worked. Um, I think that part of two of the things you've got to guard against right now, especially right now, things that are tougher than in my day when I was a junior officer, um, you must never take refuge in either victimhood, which is highly celebrated today in America. Everybody wants to be a victim. Uh, you can get 15 minutes on CNN for three days in a row if you are, um, but also cynicism. Um, critical thinking is going to take a, a, a certain amount of courage, and you can never fall back into victimhood or cynicism and think that's going to somehow enliven uh, your, your impulses to overcome the normal challenges of military service in our far-flung naval uh, organizations. Uh, so the, you know, victimhood and, uh, and, and cynicism, those are just different words for cowardice in the naval service. We don't do that. We're the varsity. We go in when, it, when it's time to move a piano, we move the piano. We don't reach for the bench. We assume it's going to be heavy load at times, and that's just the way it is. That's why we were given Al Anbar province with the Naval Service, and that's what's going to happen to you as well. Uh, and in critical thinking, we'll get into some more detail uh, when Midshipman Luke starts uh, waterboarding me here. But always remember uh, that the Naval Service is going to train you quite well for what we know is coming your way. We know how to do this. Uh, it's not rocket science, but we're going to have to educate you for what we can't anticipate so you can adjust to the normal vagaries of service as a leader. Uh, that is why, for one thing, we want to keep hold of the Naval Academy because we control the curriculum and we can make certain you have the mix of quantitative and non-quantitative background, education background, because we own the curriculum. At least I hope we still own the curriculum and we're not getting too caught up in uh, college uh, uh, you know, evaluations of what we're doing there as we try to protect this country. But um, the important thing for the midshipmen in the audience is we are, you, we are not responsible for your learning. We will bring you the education, but you must take personal responsibility for your personal development because the last thing you want to have happen to you in the, uh, in the uh, chaos and the, uh, the crisis type leadership you're going to be thrown into on many occasions is to get tapped on your shoulder and find, boy, I'm not ready for this yet. So study your history, make certain you've got a process uh, of some kind. It can be the scientific process. It can be the algebraic process. Uh, it can be the Socratic dialogues in your own mind, but you have to have a disciplined process where you bring your understanding of history forward and you break down the problems that we're going to throw in your lap with critical thinking 
but your job is to outthink the enemy and take as much of the load off your troops as you can. So at the point of contact, the enemy's annihilation is a sure thing. Um, I would just tell you too that um, uh, we we have to reward critical thinking, even when people get it wrong, especially among young officers. And institutions get the behavior they reward. It's critical too that we set the conditions and all of you will be doing that at a junior rank because the Naval Service gives more authority due to its environment than some of the other services do uh, to junior officers. We give more, we intentionally do that. And at times we will not give you full authority, yet we'll still expect absolute outstanding results. Welcome to the Naval Service. So Luke, let's uh, midshipman, uh, let's go start on the, uh, on the interrogation here. Thank you, General. This is Pete Daly. I'm going to introduce Luke. It's now my honor to introduce our moderator, Midshipman First Class Luke Miatl. Midshipman Miatl is from Los Angeles, California. He enlisted in the Navy in 2017. He completed, following boot camp, he completed basic enlisted submarine school and fire control technician A school. Luke is a proud member of the Naval Academy Preparatory Class of 2020 and will be commissioned in the United States Navy in May 24. He's held multiple leadership billets while here at the Academy, and he's currently serving as the Brigade Protocol Officer responsible for the military and social etiquette and protocol training for over 4,000 midshipmen. Upon commissioning, he wants to be a surface warfare officer. Let's welcome midshipman Miodel. Um, General Mass, it's good to see you again, sir. Um, in the interest of time, I'd like to get right into this interrogation. Uh, so in uh, 1961, President John F. Kennedy came to the Naval Academy to speak to the commissioning class. In his remarks, he stated that the nation will expect us to be more than just experts in seamanship, navigation, and leadership. He said, sir, you must understand not only this country, but other countries. You must know something about strategy and tactics and logistics but also economics and politics and diplomacy and history. You must know everything you can about military power, and you must also understand the limits of military power. You must understand that few of the important problems of our time have, in the final analysis, been solved by military power alone. Sir, knowing this, how does critical thinking change as an officer advances through their career? Well, President Kennedy set a pretty high standard, uh, midshipman, and, uh, and you all, are going to have a basic grounding in all of those things that he mentioned, uh, and you will mature as you continue to learn throughout your naval careers. But critical thinking just about always builds rank by rank on the same basic tenets. It doesn't change a whole lot. For example, at all levels, tactical, operational, strategic, think of yourself as a junior officer, and moving up to a field grade or a, a, an officer, uh, lieutenant commander, commander, uh, captain, or uh, you know, major, lieutenant colonel, colonel, uh, at the operational level generally, and even tactical and operational for flag officers when they first go in as they command those kinds of formations and then up to the strategic level. But at every level, you must start by defining the specific problem that you want to solve. Uh, and this, again, is where uh, Einstein, a pretty bright fellow, asked how he would compose his thinking, given an hour to save the world. He said, I'd spend 55 minutes. He's alleged to have said, I'd spend 55 minutes defining the problem and getting consensus on it and save the world in five. So you also, uh, embedded in what his response was, you have to have the ability to communicate the problem statement both succinctly uh, and persuasively, and that's assuming you have the right problem statement. Because if you don't, at any level, at the various points in your career, the right answer to the wrong problem statement is still the wrong answer. So this is where critical thinking really comes into play. And what is the essence of the problem? And it's not as easy to define as some people might think. And then you go into your solution uh, as a critical thinker, and there you have to know how to start with quantification. If you don't start with quantification, you're lazy. 
Uh, and then you have to know when to apply non-quant, your judgment, your military judgment, your history, your, that your knowledge of love, your, your, uh, your, your basic military problem solving. And you need to know when to apply both the non-quant and the quant. And if you do one too early, you're lazy if you don't do the quant. And if you do the non-quant too late, you're brittle and mechanistic. So it's, uh, it's probably about the same throughout the various points in the career, but it becomes more and more non-quantitative the higher in rank that you go. So there's more unknowns as you go higher up. One way to address that, because you're going to always have inadequate information to one degree or another, where you should at least assume so, make certain that you include risk assessment as you look both at your problem statement and your proposed solutions. And this don't, don't use this high, low kind of thing or green light, red light, that sort of thing. At any point in your career, make certain you're asking yourself what specific unit or element takes what specific risk for what specific period of time. And this will be the same whether you're a young junior officer, tactical platoon commander, or division officer or something like this, all the way up to being a fleet commander or the commander of a Marine division or air wing. Um, I think that what you want to do is then mitigate the risk as you see it and also unleash, always be thinking, if you're creating an organ a learning organization where there's critical thinking down through it, as you must be doing in the Naval Service, then what you want to do is look at what are two-way doors if they're two-way, if somebody does something, we can always back out of that. Or uh, if I, I'm not sure where I want to make my main effort, so I'm going to weight both of them, uh, both of my efforts the same, uh, both both numbered fleets the same, and the one that starts having the most success, I'm going to swing all the support to them. That's a two-way decision, that sort of thing. Um, and so delegate as much of that to your subordinates and the idea is that you reward their critical thinking and allow them room to apply their initiative and their aggressiveness. But if it's a one-way decision, except in extremis where there's just no time, you should keep those decisions where you're, it, it's high risk, it's, uh, you're gambling to a degree, uh, and you've got to try to, try to uh, mitigate risk so you're never in that position. But when it gets up to that level, those le those decisions you don't delegate down. But knowing what that break line is will allow you to unleash a lot of your juniors uh, to, to really take it to the enemy. And also in critical thinking, uh, what's it look like at various points in a career? You're going to find it relatively easy in the Naval Service to bring up contrary points as a junior. The higher up you go, due to the broader perspective of some of the people you're engaging with outside the military, there, there's a potential for something called the treacherous curtain of deference to your boss. Uh, George Kennan wrote those words about uh, what happened when people walk into the off Oval Office and suddenly go silent, basically. So you have to maintain your independence of judgment and without any arrogance or hubris, you do your homework and you make sure uh, that that you know uh, that you're giving your best advice uh, when you get up to the higher level. That's really where it shifts significantly. But I think up until then, critical thinking looks a lot the same at each level, even as it becomes more quantitative, more quantitative as you go up higher. Uh, back over to you, Midshipman. Thank you, sir. Uh, in, in an interview with Peter Robinson, you said you cannot simply grasp current events and fully understand them if you do not have a historical understanding. Not studying war is like going to medical school, saying cancer is such an ugly thing, and then saying we're not going to study this because it is ugly. Sir, even if the topic of war is ugly, how do you cultivate a critical thinking mindset at the different levels of leadership to include midshipmen, junior officers, and then senior admirals and generals? And then at the senior levels of the military, who mentors and coaches four-star admirals and generals in critical critical thinking to ensure victory in war? Well, first, the power of your own example is going to outweigh everything else, as will your reward system. Um, if you if you want critical thinking, 
Uh, there's times when I would tell my subordinates after they briefed me on something, well, it's not the way I'd solve the problem, but if you think it'll work, then go with it. I, let, let, let's make it work. Um, and so you want to unleash a certain amount of initiative and, and at, the, at the junior level, or you'll never get critical thinking. You'll simply get obedience. And, uh, and that's not enough. You need people to actually embrace the mission and think, this is my mission. How can I really go after the enemy and carry out the commander's intent? Um, and so what your role is, at least the one I adopted for myself, was one of player coach. I wanted to know how to play the game, but I spent most of my time coaching. Uh, and I would oftentimes be using history in my coaching at round tables or gathered around a map in a muddy uh, jungle clearing or something like that. Um, and in training, what you do to cultivate it you, you actually experiment delegating to the lowest competent level, the decision-making. And that puts the burden on people to think, how am I going to make my plan work? And you coach them. You try to catch them every time they do something right and reward them. Sometimes the reward is nothing more than great job. Uh, I've had people write me letters 30 years after I had complimented them on something that to me was almost an offhand comment because they'd done a good job. And if they still remembered it 30 years later, although they'd gone off and had many successes in life, and it still stuck with them. I think, too, uh, at the senior level, uh, as, as we go up in rank, and senior to some of your sailors and Marines may well be when you're an 03, a, a captain uh, in the Marines, a, a lieutenant senior grade. Uh, and the more that we, at those levels, um, you, you push forward the ideas. It's like you're coaching them to be as good as you. Uh, that's really what you're out to do. You want them to be every bit as good as you, and you remember the, how good you were when you were their rank. You credit them with the same degree of expertise and professionalism if you, as their coach, are giving it to them. Um, you, you asked about the senior level, and... There are courses beyond the war college. Obviously, you go through command staff college, and then you go uh, to the war colleges and all. And the time the military spends on education, is it's shocking when you get out in the civilian world and talk to CEOs who have not been back to really a good education time other than their experience in the job uh, since they left uh, graduate school of business or you go to State Department, and they're not even manned. They don't even have enough room to send 10% of their foreign service officers to school every year, like the U.S. Army, U.S. Navy, and others. So what you do is we have short courses that actually focus on the flag officers. At Newport, we've got the Jiffy Mick, the joint and uh, combined course uh, for uh, admirals, uh, young admirals and they're all young compared to me now. Uh, we have the same thing. I was just speaking to the Army J Flick course uh, yesterday uh, at Carlisle, and these are courses where small groups are brought in and retired generals and admirals are, are coaching them. Um, and I, I would just tell you that um, in private, uh, the uh, seniors are very blunt. I'll give you an example. Uh, even when I was a major, uh, actually, I was senior captain. I was a fire sport coordinator. And during an exercise, uh, I had watching me a major. Um, uh, I'm in an infantry battalion. And I hear intel come in that a balloon has just been launched near the front line, a meteorological balloon by the enemy. Okay, what do I care? Um, a little while later, uh, front line reports are coming in. The enemy is pulling back uh, from in front of us. Uh, I'm thinking, oh, great, we got them on the run. Uh, let me be thinking about this now. And then they, there's another report that uh, a guy, the young corporal, Tug Van says, hey, a reconnaissance unit behind enemy lines has just seen a lot of flashing red lights at the ammo dump at such and such a place. I said, well, that's 25 kilometers away. What do I care? Uh, we're going we're gonna to whip them in close. At that point, the major taps me on the shoulder, takes me outside the tent, literally grabbed me by the scruff of my shirt and said, 
you now have three indicators that the enemy is going to use a nuclear weapon, and you're fat, dumb, and happy thinking you're winning right now. So the mentoring that goes on is done in a rough manner. I'll be blunt about it among officers. When you get up to the, uh, the two-star level, the four stars take you off to a private tent after you give your, your end-of-the-day brief to your exercise team or something like that. But bottom line is your mentors at the highest levels are names that you often read in the newspaper. Uh, that's the only way you really learn this job is by talking to people who've been there before. But there is also a saying in the Marine Corps, don't ask for a mentor, earn a mentor. And that's probably the most important thing because it falls back on what? Same thing we talked about earlier for every midshipman. And that is that you've got to take personal responsibility for your own development. And as you do, you'll find a lot of people with my color hair eager to help you. Sir, it took you 25 years to become a one-star general. And then 10 years later, you became a four-star. And then 13 years from the time you became a one-star, you were in charge of CENTCOM as a four-star general. My personal concern is that if we, the institution doesn't start promoting critical thinking all the way at like the midshipman level, that when you rapidly get promoted to those positions, you're not going to be able to think critically without the help of those mentors on your own in a battlefield environment. And my big concern is, can old dogs really learn new tricks in this rapidly evolving world? Say, say that last part again, Luke. <laughs> that just the last sentence? Sir, my question was, can old dogs really learn new tricks in this rapidly evolving world? Well, um, until you surrender your own responsibility uh, for for learning. Uh, some of the most open-minded people I find are old. I'll give you an example. Henry Kissinger just turned 100 years old, and if you read his book on leadership, it will absolutely amaze you that what he has seen in people like de Gaulle and Thatcher, Lee Kuan Yew, Sadat, Adenauer, Nixon, and others. And what he sees there, looking back from his lofty 100 years, and he's lost nothing upstairs, uh, shows a man with a much more open mind than I often find on university campuses, to be blunt. Um, so I think military academic ac uh, academy grads, if you look at the, the education you're given, there's also a humility that comes, I think, with our military academies, and that sense of responsibility of where you're going to knowing that your troops are going to determine if you're a leader. You don't get to declare yourself a leader. The president, uh, with the advice and consent of the Senate, can make you a gentleman or gentlewoman and, and an officer commission you at a certain rank. But your troops are going to be the ones that are going to humble you. They're going to win every battle for you. And they're going to determine if you're a leader. And that humility that comes to probably 90 percent, which isn't bad, um, even Jesus of Nazareth had one out of 10 go to 12 go to crap on him. So you always have 10% that don't get it. But generally, there's a humility of our academy grads. They recognize that, uh, in fact, what they're doing is they're, they're out there with a very, very grave responsibility toward the republic, toward our constitution, and certainly toward the young lads and lasses they leave. Um, but we have too many uh, institutions, I think, nowadays turning out university-wise, um, people ignorant of history and activists and technicians, to put it in Kissinger's words, and activists and technicians don't necessarily uh, breed uh, humble leaders uh, and, and, uh, and learn new tricks. Um, but uh, I think the, the purpose of, of the history department uh, needs to be to achieve that deeper literacy because as Churchill put it, if you want to look forward, you have to be able to build on, on having been able to look further backwards. Because somewhere back there is an example of the same kind of problem you're dealing with. And you know how men or women successfully or unsuccessfully dealt with that problem. So applying history is going to be critical. Um, I'll, get, I'll give you an example of a three-star admiral applying history right after 9-11. Uh, Admiral Willie Moore, commander of Fifth Fleet, calls me in. I'm a one-star. He's a three-star. And he's got a map. He says, sit down. And he's got a map of Afghanistan. And he said, the Army Special Forces, the Green Berets, the CIA, and the Northern Alliance moving against Mazari Sharif. 
they're going to force them out of there. They've got the uh, Al Qaeda, the Taliban on the run. They're going to fall back on Kabul. Then he turned around, he pointed at me, and he said, no one's held Kabul in 500 years. He'd done his homework. Then he went back to the map and said, they're going to Kandahar. And then he sat down next to me and he said, can you get the Marines from the Mediterranean fleet and the Pacific fleet together, go 350 nautical miles in uh, to uh, Afghanistan, move against Kandahar, and raise hell, uh, based on a lot of knowledge, training, and education, I was able to immediately say, yes, we can do that. There were a dozen, two dozen things that immediately filtered through from that file cabinet in the back of my, my brain. So my point is that here was an admiral who had done his homework. He was expecting critical thinking from me. He didn't need to find out that I said yes, and then, oh, we can't do it for this reason or that reason. In the Naval Service, difficult is never an excuse, never for not accomplishing the mission. But the, the point I'm making is that oftentimes what you do with critical thinking, you don't really think outside the box, you expand the box to employ this instrument we call the Naval Service. Okay, the Marines doctrine says generally we go about 50 miles in, you know, that's you know from, from the beachhead. Well, 350 miles is taking a little poetic uh, license with 50 miles, but you know, what the heck, um, you know, seemed like a good idea at the time and doctrine can often be the last refuge of the unimaginative. And guess what? The enemy's read our doctrine too. So if you're gonna outthink the enemy, you need to know, build on what you know of doctrine, the lesson paid for in blood by your sailors and Marines, and then know when to expand or even dispense of doctrine. Um, so what we need to have you come out of the academy with is almost an insatiable curiosity that doesn't go away as you become an old dog, an old sea dog, something like that. And they, they definitely have their place too, because for them, it won't be their first fight or their second fight. Um, but I would just tell you that I would keep nearby purposely a couple of old dogs. As the commander of US Central Command, a quarter million US and allied troops, uh, when you get up to that level, people even laugh and your jokes are stupid, you know? So you got to be careful about drinking your own liquor and becoming one of those people. And I kept near me an Army Ranger Sergeant Major. His call sign was Hurricane for a reason. And uh, I kept a Navy Sea Dog captain, been there, done that. Uh, and the two of them didn't give a damn what I thought about them. They would walk in if they thought I'd made a mistake. They'd close the door and say, what you just said in the staff conference is going to be misinterpreted. Or they would come in and say, hey, remember that guidance you gave? Here's how it's being understood out in the fleet. And the, you keep someone around is going to challenge you. You have to keep the mavericks around so that you as an old dog are still learning new tricks. How's that for an answer there, uh, Midshipman Luke? I, I expect that you give me a passing grade being a Naval Academy Prep School alum. Yes, sir. That was that was incredible. Thank you. <laughs> All right, um, sir. So the the Naval Academy contributes only twenty percent of officers. <clears throat> excuse me, of officers to the Naval Service, and thirty of our thirty three CNOs have graduated from the Naval Academy. And you touched on this a little bit with civilian institutions, but our service academies currently doing enough to help midshipmen develop outside the box thinking for the next generation of warfighters and leaders. And if not, sir, what needs to be done about it? I think uh, taking the thinking, the critical thinking outside the box is based on a brilliance in the basics, in the fundamentals. If you can't do algebra in the football huddle, then you're never going to do algebra. And you're never going to apply the algebraic equation to what you have to accomplish. If you don't understand physics, and the discipline it takes to understand the laws of physics and apply them, then you're going to shy away from quantitative decision-making. At the same time, you have to have your eyes open to the fact that you're not the first one dealing with this kind of a problem. And there are other examples in history where I've turned to often uh, in, order to, uh, in order to deal with the enemy. So you put this mix together and I think the service academies absolutely are giving that basic uh, background that's necessary 
so that you can take responsibility by your reading program. The Marine Corps Commandant makes it easy because every rank's got a different bunch of books you got to read. But you should have your own reading program in addition to whatever your service requires of you so that you're never caught flat-footed. You can make, probably make, uh, we, we say in the Marine Corps, you can make captain on a good pair of legs. Bottom line, the Marine Corps will screen out enough officer candidates, uh, well over 50%. They will train you. Uh, they, the Marine Corps has no institutional confusion about its role uh, to fight and fight well. Uh, that, that's all going to be given to you. But by the time you make field grade, we expect your unit, your crew, never to be caught flat-footed. You're, you're to do three things, anticipate, anticipate, anticipate. And so it's up to you to breed in yourself a, a new form of critical thinking appropriate to the responsibilities in each leadership job you're in. But um, I would just say that, yeah, the bottom line is it's mostly a decision by individuals uh, and whether or not they want to be the kind of critical thinkers. And if they do, and if the Naval Service rewards them for it, then you'll find the institution has enough going around that you won't, uh, you won't be caught flat-footed. Thank you, sir. During your over 40 years in the military, where have you seen critical thinking mastered in your, um, in your military and civilian career? And then which United States partners have you seen master critical thinking? Um, well, I, here's the thing. In the Naval Service, especially in the Marines, we cannot solve all of our problems with mass. Uh, you can only carry so much gear on the ship. You're going to become familiar, you Navy and Marine officers, when you're out there with what's called GLOP. GLOP is gear left on the pier because you didn't do your load plan, right? You can't get everything on the ship. Well, that idea that you can't solve problems with mass means we are going to reward cunning and out-of-the-box thinking because we simply can't do with mass what some other organizations can do, Army and Air Force, for example. We're still pretty big, but we're not, we, we're not limitless in what we can do uh, in the Naval Service. So oftentimes, we find ourselves more comfortable with some of the problem-solving approaches of smaller nations or other nations, militaries, who have not the option of, of solving problems with mass either. Um, I think that uh, it, what you've got to do is... Uh, is be able to observe critical thinking when it happens. I remember coming back from a meeting in Coronado when I was a division commander. I'm sitting in the back seat of my car, and of course, my first lieutenant aide, I'm a two-star. He sat in the back of the meeting, as aides do, uh, ready to help me, which I often needed. And we're driving back up, and I'm deep in thought about how am I going to figure out how I'm going to maneuver 23,000 sailors and Marines over a marshy area with very few avenues of approach. And we're driving along, and just south of Camp Pendleton, between San Diego and Camp Pendleton, my aide notices a sign, an exit ramp, and he says to the driver, take that ramp. And I'm a little frustrated right then. I, I got to get back. I'm trying to figure something out there, Lieutenant. He says, take a look at what we're coming up on. It was Legoland. I said, okay, I got it. Uh, I'm not gonna go play with Legos. He said, what if we were to get a different colored, different size Lego for every one of the 7,500 vehicles in 1st Marine Division, and for each commander to glue his colors and his numbers on a piece of cardboard, with a coat hanger to move it around, and we make a big map of Iraq, and we start having them walk through all of that. Out of the box thinking, and he just, and if anybody's read about the first uh, battle that the Americans were in in World War I, over half our units didn't even get to the line of departure in time for the battle. It was such a mishmash of units, not knowing how to go, limited options because of mud and all this sort of thing. Bottom line was when we eventually did that and then did, a, did it again on steroids using different colored football jerseys for each of the commanders to walk on a sand table the size of uh, two football fields, 
with the British troops who were going to take over our area when we turned toward Baghdad with the Army Division that was on our left, with the fighter pilots from the aircraft carriers and the Marine uh, fighter squadrons watching, the logistics officers watching and taking notes. They watched us maneuver, and it all came from out-of-the-box thinking by a first lieutenant, probably no more than 24 months out of his undergrad uh, time. So I think that uh, what you want to do is always be open uh, to ideas, even if at first they sound crazy. In other words, if you want critical thinking, make yourself prove an idea won't work. Don't make the other people prove their idea will work. Because if you go up higher in rank, you can become more intimidating, more isolated. And make sure you always see yourself trying to keep that door open so when the uh, aide de camp turns off the vehicle on a busy day for Legoland, you understand this could be the answer to your problem. Uh, I, I've seen it though with a lot of other nations, uh, the French, um, the Brits, Australians, Norwegians, uh, Japanese. I, I've seen a lot of, of great thinking. I, I used to tell my officers at CENTCOM where we had 77 nations flags outside our headquarters. Not all the good ideas come from the nation with the most aircraft carriers. So you got to be able to, to listen to these others. Back over to you, Luke. Thank you, sir. So I'm not counting, but in 212 days, I'll graduate from the Naval Academy, commission into the Naval Service, and start my time as a junior officer. What do you recommend I do as a junior officer when I work either for an individual or an organization that lacks critical thinking? either because they are not capable or because they are so set in their ways? Yeah, well, first of all, keep a little humility. It could be that when they were junior officers, they learned the lesson. And in the urgency of the moment, their personality isn't one that, that seems to breed original thinking or, or uh, critical thinking. But in fact, uh, there is the advantage of experience. You will be a better officer if you keep your mind open and if you keep uh, working on your own personal development, you will be a better officer five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. But I would say if you get into an organization and that's your definition of the problem and make certain that you've satisfied that definition to a Jesuit's level of satisfaction, and that's pretty, uh, pretty demanding, then that simply has given you your mission. That's your mission to bring critical thinking to the organization. And you say, well, what, what, if, what if he, uh, you know, he's set in his ways and he doesn't want to hear it, that sort of thing. Uh, then make certain that you're saying, well, that's the way it is. How am I going to deal with that? And what I would recommend is twofold, going back to some of my original opening remarks there, spend time defining the problem and go to them. And there's a thing that in the Naval Service about Unigear unless otherwise directed. I've got a shipmate named Vice Admiral Bob Harwood, Navy SEAL, retired. He and I fought together so many times that we were like an old married couple. I could start a sentence, he would finish it. But he loved Unadir. He sent out messages as a lieutenant commander, a commander, a captain, a uh, commodore, uh, one star, he was a rank hog and son of a gun. He never spent time as a two-star. He went from one star to three star. But he would always put out things, Una dear, I'm going to do the following. Unless otherwise direct, here's what I'm going to do. But he spent time always explaining what the problem was. And the Una dear part was usually about two or three sentences. And so it's your responsibility, if you think the organization doesn't have it or doesn't reward it, to reward it below you, to reward it with your peers by giving them credit for good ideas or stay at saying, I'm going to use your idea, that sort of thing. Uh, it's up to you to know your doctrine so well that you know when to diverge from it because you have a problem statement that your boss uh, recognizes is right. But I would also point out that you always have to look at the processes. I said you're not there just to superintend processes but you do have to make the processes right to reward uh, critical thinking. Because if you have good people and you're gonna associate with the best people in the world and enable service. I remember an admiral telling me once who had retired, stay as long as you can in the Marines. He said, 
because you'll never serve with better people. He said, you'll make more money somewhere else, and do all sorts of things, but you'll never get up in the morning knowing you're serving with such good people. So you got good people. If you have bad processes, bad processes will win nine out of 10. So work on the process in your organization and see if you can adjust the process so that the good people's ideas can get out there. Back over to you, Luke. Great, sir. So this is our last question, wrapping up in the next four minutes or so. What lessons, if any, do the current conflicts in Ukraine and Israel teach us regarding challenging assumptions and the need for critical thinking? Whoa. Well, um, first of all, be very careful about drawing a lot of conclusions. When, you're, when you see fighting against the pathetic Russian army, uh, you may not be so lucky when you go into your fight. So be careful about dramatic instance fallacy in your own life or in what you're reading, where you draw a dramatic example of something, pull it forward, unaware that it's actually a fallacy. Make sure you do a rigorous assessment before you start saying uh, what the lessons really are, the enduring lessons. You, you all may remember this, that, but over the last 10 years, how many people have heard the next war may be fought completely with a mouse, a clicking of a mouse, cyber war? You know, airplanes won't take off, troops won't move, logistics won't be there. And guess what? Uh, you could bring back General Pershing of the U.S. Army, World War I, walk him along the front lines of, uh, of in the Donuts uh, Basin, the eastern Ukraine area, and he would recognize easily probably 75% of what was going on. War is always partly continuation, partly new. The character is always changing. So the first point I would make is it's who integrates new technology, UAVs, artificial intelligence, cyber, who integrates it better. We all know that the French and the Czechs had better tanks than the Germans at the start of World War I. Why were the Germans able to unleash hell across Europe when they didn't have the best technology? They had integrated their tanks, their infantry, their artillery, and their aviation better than anyone else and restored maneuver to the battlefields uh, after World War I. So I would just tell you that in all of these issues, you have to look for continuity and you have to look for what's new and how does that integrate better, faster, uh, and, and make it apply. So I would look at the integration piece but also remember, again, one thing that's come through loud and clear. The more you delegate authority, decision-making, to a lower-ranking people who have been trained to be credible decision-makers, even knowing they'll make mistakes, just like the generals will, but the speed of the cascading dilemmas that confronts your adversary, uh, those dilemmas will give you the advantage, what Colonel Boyd would talk about in the OODA loop, you can turn faster than the enemy. So make sure you're learning how to delegate decision-making lower and lower, because we will have radio uh, interference, electronic warfare interference, and it will come again to the human factors as they employ their drones and their snipers, their artillery, and their cyber weapons and that sort of thing. Did that, that uh, touch on what you wanted to talk about there, Luke? Yes, sir, it did. Thank you. So All on right. behalf of the, the Naval Institute, the superintendent, the faculty and staff, and the midshipmen, we would like to thank you for taking time today to speak with us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, and just make sure you're all ready to go out there and uh, lay waste to the enemy. Remember, your job is to kill the enemy and make certain the enemy knows it. So when our diplomats engage in this tumultuous world, our diplomats are respected. Thanks very much, everybody, and good luck with your conference. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Midshipman Miatl, and thank you, General Mattis. We both, for you have a book, War Transformed, Mick Ryan's book for both of you. General, we'll send it along. And in the meantime, for our next speaker, we're going to uh, introduce uh, Midshipman Brobeck to introduce him. Thank you. <laughs>